Okay, everybody. So, uh, first of all, um, a really warm welcome to everybody here this evening. Um, in case there are people who don't know who I am, um, I'll introduce myself first. So I'm Professor Pauline Walsh, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. So I'm really, really excited to have two inaugural lectures this evening of two very close colleagues of mine uh, that I've worked with over a number of years. So it's slightly extra special in that way uh, for me. Um, so first of all, um, I'd just like to say, you know, inaugurals are a really nice opportunity to share with uh, colleagues, friends, family, and, and, you know, the public, really, about the work that professors have been doing. And, and they take different formats, and people draw out different aspects of their career uh, to share with people. So I'm sure that we'll find some really interesting things uh, in both of them today. So first um, on the agenda is uh, Professor Patricia Owen. Um, and um, uh, Patricia Owen has gained recognition for her work in nursing and health education, which has spanned over 40 years. Leaving school at 16, she worked for National Westminster Bank before becoming a student nurse at North Birmingham School of Nursing, where her interest in promoting health was kindled. <coughs> interest in health promotion developed over her clinical career in elderly care nursing and public health nursing as a health visitor and during her academic career. Her research and scholarship can be described as promoting health in its broadest sense for students and qualified staff, and this evening she will be outlining some of those projects. Her work has often resulted in supporting the development of national guidelines, for example with Health Education England, on leadership learning in the pre-registration health curricula. Patricia was a founder member and past chair of the Graduate Entry Nursing International Network, where she worked with other national and international institutions to support the development of graduate entry nursing. Her impact on professional <coughs> nursing practice is also recognised through her previous work with the Royal College of Nursing as a committee member on the steering group for the Public Health Forum and as a member for other national nursing committees, including the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Patricia is currently president of the Institute of Health Promotion and Education, and as such, she works to promote health with colleagues and members from around the UK and internationally. Patricia was, until 2021, head of the School of Nursing and Midwifery at Kiel, and since retirement from this role, has taken on the role of Emeritus Professor of Nursing at Kiel, and is also Director of Academic Health Consultancy Limited. So I'm sure we'll all be delighted to welcome Patricia up onto the stage. Thank you, Pauline. And good evening, everybody. It's lovely to be here with you um, this evening. We are a little late, actually, not in time starting, but about three years late because um, uh, COVID, the COVID pandemic obviously um, put, this in, put our inaugurals back a little while. No, nonetheless, it's lovely to see you all and uh, absolutely great to be here. And thank you for coming out. Um, I hope you've brought your walking boots with you today because I'm uh, taking you down paths and I think Julie's taking you on a journey. So uh, you need those to, uh, to follow us. Let's hope it's not too rocky this evening. Um, my talk focuses on... Uh, health promotion, as Pauline has outlined, and that has really been a focal point for my nursing career. And so this evening, I aim to set the scene a little bit about what health and health promotion mean, um, and also to consider paths to promoting health that we can perhaps all think about. Um, and on the way, um, provide some examples of the research and scholarship that I've been involved in. 
And although it's not a, an in-depth lecture about health promotion, I hope it will provide some uh, uh, aspects of health promotion for you to consider. So, before we think about health promotion itself, let's have a little think about health. And I'm sure you all know that health can mean different things to different people. Um, and if we did a straw poll here tonight, you'd all say something uh, different to one another. And researchers have actually done that. In 1973, Herslick identified from a group of Parisians what health meant for them. And they talked about um, the absence of illness. They talked about health as an inner strength or resource. And they talked about health as having um, a, a potential for life. And so I think we can see that health is perhaps um, socially constructed because other researchers, for example, Blackster in 2007, identified that health can also be multidimensional. So as well as people thinking about health as an absence of illness, health can also be um, a social relationship. It can be a function that we have in our lives. It can be um, uh, some uh, uh, psychological well-being, for example. And whatever our own experiences um, uh, and feelings are about health, it's dependent very much on the society in which we live as to what we think about it. But I think we can all, all agree that health is of value to us. Um, in most cultures, it's highly prized and seen as having worth. But unfortunately, in today's society and globally, we know that inequalities exist within health. Um, there's, there's major disparities in the UK, despite advances in society and in medicine, and of course, globally. An example is here. And this is taken from uh, Professor Michael Marmot's review of health um, uh, 10 years on. This was 2020. Um, Professor Michael Marmot has studied health disparities for 30 years, and he's currently um, Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at UCL. And you can see here, if you have a look at this slide, um, uh, that he's talking about life expectancy according to sex, so male or female. But if you look on the x-axis at the bottom, you can see there's a continuum from most deprived areas to least deprived. And we can see, unfortunately, that those areas of deprivation have, as we know, um, the poorest life expectancy. And unfortunately, there's a gap of about 10 years for men and getting on for eight years for women. And the same um, can be said for preventable death. And you can see across the bottom a similar graph from the Health Foundation here around deprivation. So the continuum again and risk of preventable death along the y-axis there. Um, preventable deaths are those deaths that could, could perhaps be avoided through medical interventions or public health, health promotion interventions. And again, we can see that the most deprived have the worst health outcomes. So what about health promotion? Well, that's an, another contested concept. The term itself, health promotion, has only been about since 1974, when Mark Lalonde, who was the Canadian Minister for Health, identified the term in his report, A New Perspective on the Health of Canadians. And that was a seminal report, we realize now, because um, he identified that many of the causes of ill health were actually non-medical. So in that report, he identified, as we know now, that causes of ill health were things like 
pollution of the environment, behavioural factors, um, biophysical characteristics, and inadequacy in um, the organisation of healthcare. However, his report set the scene for the World Health Organization to develop actions and targets for health for all. And so my preferred definition of health is one from the World Health Organization 2021. You can see here that health promotion, uh, they suggest, is a process and that it's a process of enabling people to have increased control over the determinants of health. And I've put the uh, news item up there because this is a little bit of a contrast. So the World Health Organization are suggesting that health promotion is people having control over, their health, over the determinants of health. And we have, I think it was the Welsh Health Minister, you may, may have seen it here, um, uh, uh, suggesting that people just stop smoking and exercise more and that will, uh, that they'll be able to live healthier lives. And we know that health promotion is much more than just telling people what to do. Many of you will be familiar with the determinants of health and this uh, rainbow diagram by Dalgurn and Whitehead is quite old now but still identifies the social determinants of health and I've put some others um, at the side there. Um, I became passionate about health promotion when, as Pauline said, I started my training at Good Hope Hospital um, uh, way back uh, in the 70s. And I became interested in why people came into hospital and what, what um, made them so poorly, really. Beforehand, uh, as, as have been said, and just before I go on to that, you may, I don't know how, how clear that is for you, but there is, um, this was 1978, and for nurses in the room, there was a student index fee with the General Nursing Council of one pound fifty. And that covered the whole three years training. <laughs> um, so I left school at 16 and uh, worked for NatWest Bank. Um, I didn't excel at banking. I um, couldn't balance the till. And so I had to look for other opportunities. Um, and uh, I, I obviously eventually um, applied for nursing. But before... Um, uh, before that, I just wanted to uh, let you know that I was the only daughter of my lovely mom and dad, um, Pip and Chris, and my mom's here today, so it's lovely um, to have her with, with us this evening. Um, my, my dad was an agricultural rep, and my mom worked in retail all of her life, um, so uh, they supported me on my journey. Uh, as well as my lovely husband, Paul, and uh, our son, Graham, and his fiancée, Robin, who are all here supporting me tonight. And as ever, I'm always grateful and couldn't have got where I am without their support. I'm not sure how much you can see of this model. So... Thinking of uh, health promotion and thinking of it as having control over the determinants of health, Green Tones and colleagues developed a model of health promotion that focused on empowerment. Um, they suggest that health can be improved through impact and influence to provide and, uh, people to take more control over those determinants of health. And I just want to point out three areas here. I don't know how clear it is. This says education and training. We've got at the top health, healthy public policy. And then we've got health services and medical services here. And they're suggesting that those are key areas to support people to gain control. And I want to focus on those three areas and, and use them as a sort of framework for, for some of the other work that I've been involved in. 
So that first one, medical and health services supporting empowerment. Um, all of us involved in healthcare are health promoters. But when I um, qualified as a state registered nurse, I did some time in surgical nursing, but then really wanted to try and provide more health promotion uh, support to people, and I trained as a health visitor. Um, today they're called specialist community public health nurses. Um, and um, are, are very much involved in the promotion of health, particularly for families with the under, under fives and communities involved in building physical health, building mental health, and um, helping support child, children in their development. Um, in those days, when I worked as a health visitor, we were attached to GP surgeries. And so I worked with a group of colleagues, GPs, district nurses, practice nurses, community psychiatric nurses, and social workers in Warsaw, another deprived area of the Midlands. As well as a caseload, over time as a health visitor, I um, was asked to be lead for uh, the liaison for the traveling families. And some of, the air, some of the issues that they faced, we tried to focus on. And one was increasing immunization rates. Another was trying to support families, enable their children to have access to school. And what we tried to do was reorientate health services a little bit with, 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 those, with that client group. And we, I, we sort of took the clinic to the campsite. Um, I don't have any stats or figures around that because it was a, a while ago now. Um, but I do think we made an impact. But by developing a therapeutic relationship, which is really what nursing, uh, whichever sort of nursing you, you're involved in is about, it was possible to promote health, infant and family health, um, through things like assessing family health needs, um, developing interventions to promote child development, promoting healthy, healthy eating, um, provo promoting mental and maternal and infant mental health, um, and supporting parents to manage common childhood ailments and work with them to promote, uh, prevent home accidents. Unfortunately, in past years, um, 12 years, we have seen health visiting numbers reduced um, with uh, successive governments. However, there are still um, health visitors and other specialist community public health nurses out there who are delivering public health to families and communities. And recently, we were asked by, the, uh, by Public Health England um, which has now changed its name to the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, um, to uh, consider um, the issue of digital technological approaches to delivering public health services. Um, with colleagues here, particularly Gwen Wynne-Jones and Nagin Mustafa and other colleagues um, that are, are here in the room, um, we, we were asked to consider the problem that since the COVID pandemic, as we know, many health services have had to be delivered through te technological means. So for example, we're all familiar with video calls, phone calls, but also text messages and SMS messages and apps. And we aim to investigate the specialist community public health nurses' experience and also parents' and clients' experience of receiving services that way. Um, you can see the methods we used here. In the end, we had 77 nurses participate and we managed to have six clients' parents participate in our survey. And our findings were that digital technologies really do have a place in the delivery of public health services to children and young people. But there are many challenges that haven't yet been addressed and which we need to address. 
Those challenges are things like the governance of the technology, training for the technology usage, both for the staff and for um, clients. Safeguarding of clients and uh, children. Confidentiality. Difficulty in assessing family health over a video. Problems with communication. And the digital divide came up time again by parents and by specialist community public health nurses. Um, we know that many people don't have access to technology or that technology is too expensive for them. And so that's an issue when services move to um, this approach. We also know that digital literacy is an issue, so people aren't always familiar with how to use technology. And so um, the, there's work to be done here. We have made our final report to the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities, and they've asked us to go and speak with them in March, um, and we're working on some papers for publication. Um, the other uh, area that we know of is that we, our health can be affected by work itself. Um, and we know that there are many stressors, particularly in healthcare. Um, and it's been known for some time that newly qualified nurses experience stress when they transition from being a student to working as a qualified nurse. And as far back again as 1974, Kramer identified this and called it reality shock. They felt anxious and underconfident as they entered the profession. And this can affect their well-being. And the Department of Health has suggested for some time that newly qualified nurses receive support in their first few months as a newly qualified nurse. And this piece of work was um, in conjunction, particularly with Dr. Bill Whitehead and colleagues from Derby University and a trust in Derbyshire who asked, asked us to consider um, preceptorship and support in their trust. And as you can see here, we undertook a case study approach to this piece of work. And we did focus groups with preceptors and matrons and preceptees and learning environment managers. And after analysis of that work, we identified that um, preceptorship was really important. Um, and the, the, the notion of preceptorship actually improved uh, newly qualified nurses' confidence it improved their job satisfaction. For health promoters, it helped reduce their anxiety, they reported. And it also improved retention rates, so the organisations were, were keen on preceptorship. And we managed, uh, with our colleagues, to develop a toolkit for organisations to use to support preceptorship um, through the um, uh, th through their organisation. And that, uh, that piece of work has been uh, uh, used by the Nursing and Midwifery Council for their principles for preceptorship and also by the NHS National Preceptorship Framework. Um, if you cast your minds back to Green and Tone's model of empowerment, one of the other uh, aspects they talked about was education and training to support empowerment. And in terms of health visiting, a large part of a health visitor's work, a large part of a nurse's work is around education, educating our, our patients and clients. And I think whatever aspect of education we're involved in, we know it can have a really empowering effect for people. As a health visitor, as I was very involved in education of clients and with clients. So, for example, I ran antenatal classes for pregnant mothers and work in schools to get children thinking about their own health, their physical and mental well-being. 
And throughout my career, I've managed to lead programs, especially, for example, Master of Public Health and Specialist Community Public Health Nursing courses. And you can see here a photo um, uh, from the 19, latter part of the 1980s where I first went into um, education and we developed a whole curricula for pupil nurses, if you remember those, um, uh, that was uh, developed on, on health, a whole curricula on health. And education has been empowering for me. I studied my BSc nursing at Birmingham Polytechnic. I did my Masters of Public Health at Nottingham University and my PhD at Lancaster University. And going through those journeys has enabled me to support other people. And I'm really pleased tonight that um, Dr. Susan Schofield, who also did her PhD at Lancaster, uh, is with us today. Um, and she knows the challenges of working and studying and, and bringing up a family uh, as well. My PhD focused on an analysis of factors affecting health visiting policy. And um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, that work um, uh, supported a lot of the uh, um, education that I've been involved in. For students studying nursing, we know that there are challenges as well, especially when they go out into clinical placement, and students can sometimes feel anxious um, uh, about that. And uh, along working with Professor Pauline Walsh, who led this piece of work, um, we developed resilience building activities in the curricula to support um, students and to help them take a little bit of control about some of those challenging situations. This is a, an example of a piece of the published work, a confidence scale that we developed for them in, in line with some of those resilient building activities. And this has been well received. I think um, we've had about 20 um, uh, uh, queries about using this, both in the UK and around the world. And we're still working on the, a model for supporting this work. You may think, what has leadership got to do with promoting health? But we all know that um, a, a compassionate and authentic leader can support the health and well-being of staff as well as their patients and service users and clients. And in this project, we were very keen to learn more about what learning about leadership looked like. And working with Coventry and Worcester universities, um, we undertook focus groups across eight regional trusts. And the um, ethics for that was quite intricate, as you can imagine, gaining ethical approval. Um, and we identified that good leadership is, is often about role modeling and having leadership learning throughout the curriculum. And Adam Turner, I don't think Adam could come tonight, but um, he was the programme lead for Health Education England for that project and asked me to join him in the next part of the project, which was around developing guidelines for, um, health educa for education providers like us. And we took a co-production approach in um, organising this. So we uh, had the original research that we'd undertaken, we did a further literature review. We actually considered um, uh, the regulatory bodies. What did they tell us about leadership and what, how it should be taught and what they wanted in the curricula? And I think we reviewed about 50 PRSB guidelines and also looked at current practice. What were institutions teaching around leadership learning in health curricula? And I think we, I uh, contacted about 80 institutions and developed guidelines which you, some of you may be familiar with to support that idea that people can learn to be leaders at the very start of their curricula right through to the end. The final um, part of the uh, empowerment model um, that I wanted to mention was around healthy public policy. 
And how can we, as health professionals, um, support that development? And I've just put a few ideas down the side that I've been um, involved with. I'm, as Pauline said, I'm currently president of the Institute of Health Promotion and Education. And uh, through that organisation, we're able to uh, lobby through letters and through publications. We publish the Health Promotion and Education International Journal. Um, and also join with other organisations to lobby and to advocate. And um, tomorrow, actually, we're joining the launch of the Health Equity Network that Professor Michael Marmot, who I mentioned at the beginning, um, is, is uh, uh, launching with, uh, with a range of organisations. And so we hope that that will go some way towards minimising the gap between health inequalities. So, I guess in conclusion, I think I'm asking you to consider your own paths to promoting health, whichever aspect that may be in, and whatever your discipline, education, medical and health services, advocacy, lobbying and health promoting coalitions to support public policy. We can all take a role in promoting the wider public health. I've got some references there, and I just want to say thank you. Um, this is a, a photo of me um, uh, when I was a ward sister in elderly care. What looks like medieval times by the look of that phone. Um, but um, that's another story, I guess. Thank you very much. <laughs>